It is, as Scotty mentioned, a real honor to welcome a true Dobsonian. I'd like to welcome you, I'd like to introduce to you, rather, the San Francisco Sidewalk Astronomer founder. And we are indeed, it is a great pleasure to have him here. John Dobson. Can you all hear me? Yeah. No. Only the nose count. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh dear, dreadful. Um, first, I have to thank you all for getting me here. And then I have to thank Russell W. Porter. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> then I have to thank, salute Russell W. Porter for getting this whole thing started. I'm feeding back. Can you all hear that? <laughs> Who fixes that? <laughs> Who, fixes that? <laughs> Who fixes that? I'm working on it. Keep talking. Don't come close to it. Is that okay? Okay. I have to salute Russell W. Porter because he really uh, gave the big push to this amateur telescope making. And uh, we really all run in his footsteps. As Newton said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I have to thank also, salute also the man who had the good sense to support him. Uh, I slept in his house last night, and I was very pleased. And it cost me $6 this morning for two eggs and a bowl of cereal. <laughs> I should tell you a story. I was just recently up in uh, Ukiah, that's north of San Francisco, about 110 miles, working on two 24-inch mirrors. And I, from there, I was invited to the uh, summer scientific meeting of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific down in Pomona in Southern California. So I had to bebop down to San Francisco and have a few minutes rest and off to Pomona. But that was a very interesting conference. That was the biggest conference they've ever had. They had over 900 registrants. And um, that's not a telescope maker's conference. That's an astronomer's conference. And Alan Sandage gave what I thought was the nicest talk. He gave a two-hour talk, very slow, very deliberate, so that anyone could follow him. And you know, he's a big bang man. Oh, somebody suggested while I was at the conference that I should get up and say, everything I've heard at this conference is about the big bang. What's the big bang? <laughs> anyway, I didn't do that. But he gave a very nice talk. And he wanted to show that the uh, Hubble constant has to come out at 42. Now, some have suggested that it may be as low as 25, and others have suggested 75, 80, or 90, or 100. But he wants it to come out at 42 so he can get the Big Bang to go. He says, I want it to go. <laughs> well, all through the morning, and it was a two-hour lecture, he spoke about the creation event. And so at the end, during the question period, uh, after several other questions had been uh, 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 addressed, I asked, um, since we are now willing to talk about the creation event, why must we assume that in the absence of space and time, there is nothing? Isn't it an unwarranted assumption? I could understand that in the absence of time, we would have absence of change. That's a warranted assumption. And that, they, and that in the absence of space, we would have the absence of dividedness and the absence of smallness. That also seems to me to be warranted. But that gives you the changeless, the infinite, and the undivided, which to me seems like a long ways from nothing. <laughs> Well, it's not that he could handle the question. He couldn't touch the question. But, but 
But before I was through, some lady saw where it was going and she muffled a shriek. <laughs> and it caused a real stir. Well, I think really this is a very important question. Apparently the Big Bang people are willing to assume that in the absence of the universe there is absence of space and time, and that in the absence of space and time there is nothing. And I don't think that it's a warranted assumption. And I would rather look at it this way. We have to ask our physics what the, what the physics says is behind what we see. Whether there is any evidence in our physics that there's a changeless behind what we see, and whether there's any evidence that it's the undivided and the infinite behind what we see. And that's what I think the evidence in the physics is. I think inertia is the evidence that's what be, that what's behind our physics is the changeless. And that the electrical charge on the, elect, on the electrical particles is the evidence that what's behind our physics is the infinite, not zero. And that the uh, fact that all the dispersed particles fall together by gravity is an evidence that the undividedness is what we have mistaken for this universe. Well, anyway, I didn't go through all that down at Pomona because we just had to flush the question down the tubes when he was unwilling to talk on it. <laughs> but I think that that's a very serious consideration. Now, in my, you know, I never did, uh, I never was really all that interested in telescopes. I know my name has become attached to a telescope and it had no business to do that. <laughs> so far as I know, I am the only one who has always complained about calling telescopes by people's names. I am the one who always said Matsutov, Schmatsutov, Cassegrain, Schmassegrain, Schmidt, Schmidt. <laughs> It's Dobsonian, Schmobsonian. <laughs> well, at any rate, it's like reinventing the cup, you know. The military has been shooting each other dead with these things ever since they had gunpowder. And there's nothing odd about it, but uh, apparently nobody ran telescopes this way, and I cannot figure out why. But at any rate, I was not particularly interested in telescopes. I'm interested in information. I'm interested in the problem of making it possible for the people who live in this world to see this universe the way it really is, and you have to do that through telescopes, and you have to do it at night, and to help them understand this world, you see. Now, to me, it is not so much how big your telescope is, it's not so much what the figure of the mirror is, or the lens, or what have you. It's not so much what pretty pictures it takes, it's how many people in this vast world, less fortunate than you, have had a chance through your telescope to see and understand this world. To me, that is the one thing that drives me. in the daytime. By the way, I have some pictures of our fail-safe sun telescopes, and I wish more of you would look at those pictures. We have a front cover plate that's at 45 degrees, and it's partially aluminized on the back side. You keep the front side bare so that people with ice cream on their hands can ha get at it, and you can get it off again. But the inside surface is aluminized, and that's through about 5% of the light. Then the objective is unsilvered and returns about 4%. Then that little bit, about one part in four or 500, is reflected from the back side, from the, from the first surface of the, inside of the front plate through a welder's glass into the eyepiece, and the welder's glass eats about 99% of the remainder. So we let you use about 20 millionths of the incoming beam, and it's an unobstructed reflector and it's fail-safe because if the front plate is broken, you're looking at the ground through a welder's glass. And that is known to be safe. <laughs> the only way you can burn your eye with one of these sidewalk astronomers' sun telescopes is to set fire to the telescope and carefully hold your eye over it. 
suppose now, if you people want to ask me some questions, you could ask me some questions. I won't be able to see your hands, just shout it out. How did you first get interested in uh, what you're doing now? Well, I was in a monastery in those days. We always called it a monastery. <laughs> I joined the monastery in 1944, and I got thrown out in 1967 for helping the kids in the neighborhood make telescopes. <laughs> now, actually, you don't get thrown out of a monastery for helping people make telescopes. You get thrown out for being AWOL. You understand AWOL? Absent without leave, A-W-O-L, absent without leave, it's a military term. But you see, in a monastery, if you're AWOL, they assume that you did it, and that is the problem. <laughs> anyway, before I got thrown out of the monastery, and that was in Sacramento in 1967, there were already 15 12-inch telescopes around the neighborhood. You could throw a stone from one house with a 12 incher to the next. And I had already figured two 18 inches. One of them is now set up, and we use it all the time. That's the one I say was called the little one. We never did call a telescope the big one. But we do have a 31-inch blank, but we've never made it into a telescope. We need a, somebody to cut it into two slabs at six and a half inches deep. And we do not run around with forklifts to put our mirrors in their cells. As did you see, to understand, why do we see a universe at all? And why, if we do see a universe, do we see the kind of universe that we see? Why do we see the universe spaced out in space and time? And why is it made of gravity? Why is it made of electricity? Why does it fall together by gravity? And why do bicycles coast? <laughs> now you know, we send all the kids to high school before we let them go to the university. You know why that is. So that they will not ask the professor why the spoons fell to the floor. The professor hasn't a ghost of an idea why the spoon fell to the floor, and he doesn't want to be quizzed on it. <laughs> but I cannot take those things for granted. I cannot take for granted that these teeny-weeny particles have to be electrical. To me, the only reason, the only explanation is because the infinite has to show through in the small. And I cannot take it for granted that all these dispersed particles have to fall together by gravity. As I see it, the only reason they fall together by gravity is because the undivided has to show through in what we, in, in the divide, in the appearance of division. And the only reason the bicycle's coast is because the changelessness shows through in the, in the appearance of change. You remember how Newton put it. Corpus omne perseverare in statu suo quiescendi, vel movendi uniformitari indirectum, nisi quatenus illud a viribus impressis cogitur statum suum mutare. Bodies all persevere in their states of quiescence or of motion uniform in direction, unless by forces impressed upon them they are compelled to change their states. Now, I suppose if you like, I can show you some slides, or do you want to go look through the telescope? All right. Some people save my reputation. I made telescopes that are ugly to look at, but okay to look through. Now, here's some guy grinning from ear to ear, pulling on his rough club around the mountain ten and a half inches. These are all pork rolls. I, uh, years ago, borrowed a bunch of money and went down and bought four tons of porthole glass from American Salvage. That glass is long ago gone. People ask me sometimes how many telescopes I've helped people make. I can only give you an estimate in the tonnage. It's, I don't know how many, I don't even know how many tons, but it's in the neighborhood of four tons of glass that made into mirrors. Because a lot of that was tool glass, of course, but I've bought many, several tons of glass since then. Anyway, here we're doing the caveman job. And there he's testing to see if he's in the ballpark for his focal length. These, part, these aren't in order. There he's testing the focal length, and he hasn't got his brother's tummy. <laughs> now, there he's being regurgitated by the two. <laughs> Now, 
One of my friends once said about me, J.D. eats pitch and sleeps in the tube. <laughs> but of course we do, you know, we do sleep in the telescopes. So we've, we sleep in the 24-incher all the time when it's not set up. It takes two people end to end, you know, unless they're more than six feet. And uh, the record for sleeping in the 24 is eight weeks. Gerard had to sleep eight weeks there when the, boat, the bus broke down. <laughs> Now, I want you to look very carefully at the size of that telescope and see what happens. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? <laughs> now, this man made a very charming telescope and very careful workmanship and all, and he painted that with seven coats of marine enamel. Now, I have always argued that there's no need to paint telescopes white. I don't have any idea how it ever got started. They're not used in the daytime. If they were used in the sun while you're looking at Jupiter, that would be one thing. You'd want them to be able to handle the sunlight. But they're used at night, and what you want them to be able to handle is the infrared. Now, marine enamel will not handle in the infrared. And on a night when no other telescope dews down, this one dews down between one and two hours after sundown. And at the Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley, with the sun streaming down on the top of that tube, the top of the tube was cooler than the bottom. I couldn't believe my hands, so I turned my hands over and called my friends. They couldn't either believe till they turned their hands over. But the top was a great deal cooler than the bottom. The bottom cannot handle the infrared radiation from the pavement, but it can, the paint can handle the, the visible light from the sun. And so I've always argued, you see, that telescopes need to be painted with some kind of paint that can handle in the infrared. It don't mean no, never mind what they do in the visible. Unless they're sun telescopes, and the sun telescopes face straight into the sun anyway, all day long, and it don't mean no, never mind what they're painted with. <laughs> And you know, some people do nice, neat work. This is the psychedelic giraffe. <laughs> this is a long focal length one, and um, this is again also made out of the Navy portal. It was made by a sixth grader. And people used to ask me sometime, what do you do to get a telescope? I say, first you get the Navy to scuttle a ship, then you get a sixth grader. <laughs> Now, this was made by a 15-year-old girl, and she was into The Hobbit. And so she's got all kinds of pictures. I'll show them to you later. But when we were figuring her mirror, we, she came to my house to figure the mirror. And I told her, we've got it already to an eighth of a wave. I said, with a little care, we might get it to a sixteenth. She says, what's the use? It's only a nine-incher. <laughs> my hero. <laughs> anyway, that's just to show that it's portable. Now, that's what she wrote on the back. That says Fendorn, but don't ask me. <laughs> now, there's one of our little sun telescopes. You see, the front end is cut at 45 degrees. This is just a little peewee that lived in Phoenix for a while. Now, there's the front end of our big sun telescope. That's a 10 and a half inch. It now lives in Colorado. I haven't seen it for many years. I had to sell it for diagonal mirror wraps. But uh, that one gives the sun at 93 power, and that's very convenient. You can tell people that's the way the sun would look if you were one million miles away behind a big, thick welder's glass. But in five minutes, the welder's glass would vaporize, and in another five minutes, you would. <laughs> Now, here we are at Fremont Peak State Park. That's about 24 inches over there, and various other telescopes there. Here's the 24 inch at Glacier Point. The 24 inch has sat more than 100 nights at Glacier Point, and that's a fabulous place. Uh, it's uh, 7,500 feet, 7,200 feet above sea level, and it's right on the brink of a cliff, and there's only a little high ground above it, and the air that comes down over the high ground comes right through the forest and comes out very slowly and falls right <laughs> off the rocks. And the seeing conditions there are very, very good. It's very, very dark. We've seen the uh, Corona Borealis cluster of galaxies from there. That's about, oh well, anyway, that's about far enough away. So the light we see now left those galaxies when during the formation of the late Precambrian -Pre rocks at the base of the Grand Canyon Gorge, 
and over those rocks seven oceans have come and gone while the light's been coming. Anyway, so that's the farthest away thing we've seen, and we've seen it from Glacier Point, and it's a fabulous place, very dark, and uh, the transparency is very good, and the turbulence is very low, and it's cozy and warm at night. And when we first got to Glacier Point with this telescope, well, I should tell you the story. I told uh, Brian Rhodes, Brian Rhodes and I made that telescope. It took us three months to make the telescope from start to finish. It took us 19 hours to grind and polish that mirror. It took us longer to figure it because we had to get it out of town. It was the fog season in San Francisco, and so we had to get it out of town. But we finished it in three months. And uh, so after we finished it, I told Brian that probably Glacier Point in Yosemite is one of the best places in this whole world for a public telescope. But I says, there's that damned hotel. But we went up there and the hotel had just burned down. <laughs> so this telescope has sat on the grounds where the old hotel used to stand, either there or on the front road, for more than a hundred nights. And that's a very, uh, you know, you can't test the seeing conditions for a big telescope with a little one, but you can test seeing conditions for little telescopes with big ones. Anyway, a Glacier Point is a very good place. I'd like to see at least 18 or 20 18 inches permanently mounted there. But one of the rangers at, at, Crater, at, uh, at uh, Yosemite hadn't figured out in the right way. He said, if we put telescopes in the national parks, We'll have to house the telescopes, we'll have to procure the telescopes, we'll have to take care of the telescopes, we'll have to hire train rangers to run the telescopes, we'll have to hire them to run the telescopes. And he says, we'll, if we leave the, the telescopes and the slideshows and the know-how with the sidewalk astronomers, we could get you from park to park for about five grand a year. He had it just figured out in the right way, and we never met him again. <laughs> They transferred into some other park. Anyway, here we are up at Glacier Point in the snow. I was sick that day and down the floor of the valley. Here we are at another time. And there's, there's the 10 and a half inch sun telescope, the one painted all fancy red and yellow over there now. It's gone through a lot of paint jobs. Now here we have an unobstructed mask on the front end. You see that? We're looking at Venus in the daytime. Now, on the 24-incher, we have a 13-foot focal length, a little better than 13-foot focal length, and with that 10-by-15-inch uh, by, uh, by ellipse on the front, we have an unobstructed reflector, like a sheaf's figure. It's a 10-inch uh, by 15-inch unobstructed reflector, and with that, we've seen uh, Schiaparelli's Canali on Mars and all kinds of junk on, the Mar on Mars that I haven't even seen in the books. Now here we broke down at Button Willow. <laughs> this is near the population center of California. But my van broke down, and uh, so Gerard, I mean uh, Brian Rhodes, had to take the engine apart and rebuild it. And in two days we were back on the road. But meanwhile, I took a sun telescope over to the school, and uh, we ran the whole school class by class through the sun telescope. And I gave them all a slideshow. Now they have these fabulous murals in the hall. One of the teachers and the kids made all these fabulous murals. They're made out of broken glass and white glue and various colored things, and they're absolutely fabulous, and they belong in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If you get to Button Willow while school is on, go to the school and ask the superintendent of schools if you can look at the murals in the hall. Anyway, here we are. Now there's um, Dr. Lucinian. He's a professor at Stanford University in, in um, uh, communications, and he's making a 16-inch I'll get to it when it's finished after a little while. He watches the TV while he does it. There's 1,000 there. Now here we are at um, 7,000 feet in the Sierra, and there's 24 inches over here past the van, and the one on the left is Ruthie. That's an 18-inch unobstructed reflector. It had astigmatism, and we figured the curve, so the axis of the curve is about one inch in from the edge of the glass. So the diagonal is right over your eyepiece tube. Your eyepiece tube comes in through the side of the big tube, and then you have a diagonal right over it, and you can't see anything past the eyepiece tube except the objective. And so that's an unobstructed uh, reflector, and uh, at one of the star party sites, they stole everything from his telescope except, except the objective because they couldn't get it out of the box. It was locked in. 
Now this is the front end of our friend Pauline. Jared has a, sp a black widow spider mount. <laughs> now there we're figuring that um, 16 inch here uh, for Dr. Lucinian. And here I'm running my thumb around. It has a hill just a little ways inside the head. And so there, when I first saw that picture, I couldn't imagine why I had my thumb on the glass. And I remembered afterwards. There's Jean Lucinian. I think she's a ballerina now. She's grown and gone. And she's pressing the face not far. Those are my hands on Thanksgiving Day. Now, here's the telescope when it's finished, and it's called the Magnificat because it magnifies, and we're at, at, the, at Furnace Creek uh, Visitor Center in Death Valley, and uh, he has the tube come apart like that, and uh, all of us, six of us, and that telescope went in that little motor home. And those are the funeral mountains behind us. This is in the floor of Death Valley, below sea level. But the seeing conditions there aren't as bad as you might think. But one year we took the 24 inch year up to Dante's view, that's four and a half thousand feet above the salt flats. And that was the best view we ever had of, the, of Omega Centauri. All the way across the eyepiece field and out into the wings with these minuscule stars. It was absolutely fabulous. From there we went to Riverside, but the seeing conditions in Riverside were nowhere near like they were at Dante's view. There we are putting it away in the vehicle. There I am lining up the optics. They were looking at Saturn in Death Valley. I guess we ran out. Yep, we ran out. Now we can take it out. I have some sun telescope pictures which Gerard Pardelen made, and I'll leave them up here on the front. If any of you people want to look at them, you can do that. I think I still have them with me. Did I throw them out accidentally? No, they're, in, they're here. I'll leave them up here on this bell. Pictures of how our sun telescopes work. <laughs> 